Good morning, everybody. That was good, but not great. Good morning, everybody. Ah, you guys make me smile. My name is Nikki Rood. I am the blessed person that gets to be the Children, Youth, and Family Ministry Director here at St. Andrews. Pastor Dave is normally the one up here doing all the good stuff. You're stuck with me today, sorry. Um, Until August 1st, actually, because he's on sabbatical, which means that he is at a time of prayer and of um, meditation and rest and relaxation. And right now he's at Holden Village. I am so jealous. But he's at this wonderful place that has absolutely no cell services. This is killing him. Kind of funny, actually. I can get away with just about anything. Um, Welcome to those of you who are worshiping with us online or either while we're streaming or later on when it's uh, posted on YouTube or Facebook. Um, We are going to be celebrating the sacrament of communion today. So those of you at home, I welcome you to take the time to gather some bread or some crackers, some wine or some grape juice so you're ready for it when we do our communion. Um, Also, if you would like to give to support the ministries at St. Andrews, We very much appreciate it. There's lots of ways to do it. You can go to our website, which is www.standrewsgrandrapidsmn.org. Did I do it right? I think so. Okay. It's hard. Okay. And then also, on the back of your pews, for those of you who are with us right now, you'll see things that show you how to text to give and a QR code. Um, Also, we just do the old-fashioned way. We'll come around with some big old plates. And then today is also our noisy offering where we give to the um, food shelf here, the Second Harvest food shelf in town. So you'll be getting to hear, drop your noisy change. I mean, they like dollars too, I'm not going to lie. But it's fun to drop your noisy change and make a big racket. Um, Usually when we have kids here, it's really fun. (laughs) Um, I want to welcome, drum roll please, that was good, <laughs> Pastor Vicki Taylor is here with us today, and it was before I was here, but you were here, you were the pastor here, so it's kind of cool, it's like coming home, it's awesome. Um, we're very excited to have her preaching and presiding today, and at this time I'd like to call up Mr. Conley Jansen. For those of you who may have been with us last week, you know we, we had some issues, but we've made up. We didn't have issues. <laughs> I was getting my coffee. I, was, uh, I had no issue at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm Conley Jansen, current president of our church council. I've got a couple quick announcements to make. Uh, number one is that uh, the end of this month, beginning of next month, sometime there, our back driveway is going to be closed off. I just wanted to remind everybody of that due to some work that they're going to be doing out there in the right of way. That's just, you know, worst case scenario, you just have to turn around and go out the other one. But, uh, and also going forward, probably, hopefully, cross my fingers, next month we'll be getting the parking lot striped. Part of that is going to be that that will be an entrance and that will be an exit. It'll be marked accordingly. I don't think the You know, the parking lot police aren't going to get after you if you accidentally go out the other one, but it's just something that we're going to try to try to make change with. Until the snow flies, and then we won't know anything. (laughs) So the other thing is, uh, June 25th coming up, so that's two Sundays from now, or one Sunday from now, two Sundays, depending on how you count. Uh, Deacon Colleen Bernou is going to be our our guest speaker. She's going to be taking care of us, and she's going to have a kind of a coffee conversation, an open meeting conversation after the service. And I think we're going to be doing it out in the fellowship hall, so everyone will already be out there drinking their coffee, eating cookies and donuts. And the focus of that is going to be over the last three or four years, or two or three years, and we've all heard about it so much now that we're probably, you know, like, okay, let's just move on. But part of moving on is realizing where we're at and how things have changed over the last few years. And, you know, how does it really change our focus and how does it change our mission in the church and that's what she's just going to try and invite some conversation and have a open dialogue about that type of stuff where we've changed over the last few years and everybody is invited and we'll just make that happen for her so that's all i've got thank you oh one more thing uh 
We are still looking for our front office person out there, whatever you want to label that job position to be. So if anybody in here or out in internet land knows of anybody that would be a good fit for our church administrative person, send them our way. And even if they, you know, even if it's someone that you just think would be a good fit and they don't really know or they don't want to do it, <laughs> give them our name anyways and we'll reach out to them and, you know. So you can throw your friends under the bus or whatever and we'll, we'll grab a hold of them and We love them. unwilling staff so, people. Yep. Thank you. And that job description is in full on our website too, just so you know. Um, next we have Dave Lawrence. You know, I don't ever remember Pastor Dave having so many guest speakers when he's here. Does he just tell you guys no? And I just <laughs> tell everybody yes. I just always wondered. Thanks. <laughs> uh, as Nikki said, I'm Dave Lawrence. I'm on the properties committee. And we noticed that there were some weeds cropping up out amongst the plants that were um, put in last year. <laughs> it's only been a year. Um, so they're coming up. So it would be great if some of you could stick around and, and uh, pick some weeds. In the, in the rocked area, they're really easy to distinguish between re <laughs> weeds and uh, plants that are supposed to be there. We have some boxes to put those weeds into, and then they can go into the... Uh, compost bin afterwards. Um, thank you. Thanks, Dave. I have one last announcement just when you thought it couldn't get better. Uh, I invite you in your exit today. There's some posters that are on our doors that are opened right now, but they're normal when, you know, when they close, they open. That's how doors work. Anyway, there's two posters about Nadia Boltz Weber. And a lot of you might not know who that is, but she speaks at pretty much every youth gathering that there is because she is a prolific speaker and pastor. And she's what we would call in most Lutheran congregations unconventional. She, she believes she has a church. I think it's called the Church for All Saints and Sinners. Isn't that correct? And somehow, and I, I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. Somehow the Presbyterian Church got together with Nadia, got together with other places, and they made it to where she is coming to the Rife for free on June 23rd. I was given, they're just giving tickets away at the Presbyterian Church. You just have to call and reserve them. I personally was given 20, and I have eight left of my own. And they're just basically first ones that tell me they want one, they get one. But if you ever have a chance to go to YouTube, just look her up. She is... Unconventional is a, a word for it, but a breath of fresh air in this world that we have right now. Anyway, I just wanted to add that to our announcements. Everything for you for worship is going to be projected in front of you. If, um, if you like to have, you know, musical notes to look by and there's a hymnal number up there, then you can open up the cranberry colored hymnals and follow along that way. But otherwise, everything is going to be projected. And I invite you to stand as you're able as we start our first song, Morning Has Broken, and that is 556 in the hymnal.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Please take a few moments of silence to reflect on your sinfulness and to lay your burdens at the feet of your Lord. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Lord, have mercy. Now God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are all forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen. Glory to God in the highest.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Together, let us pray. O oh God, you are the source of life and the ground of our being. By the power of your Spirit, bring healing to this wounded world and raise us to the new life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. And at this time, I would like to encourage any kids of any age. Acolytes, I need you. Thank you. Oh, my kids, it's summertime. It's hard to get you all here, but I understand. <laughs> it's hard to sit down in robes, isn't it? <laughs> Try a dress sometime. I think it's great that you guys are here. Today, did you guys notice like the slide, how it has like those footprints? What does that look like? Uh, what does it look like they're walking on? Snow. <laughs> it, that is a Minnesota answer. <laughs> I can't say you're wrong. It's actually sand, I think. Um, but you know, it's that, that walk of, have you guys ever walked in sand with bare feet? Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever walked in snow with bare feet? Yeah. 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 Okay. True Minnesotans. Okay. You know, I loved this picture. I chose this picture. And the reason I liked it so much is that because it reminds me that even though it looks like we're sometimes kind of all alone on our journey, on our path, that we're never fully alone, are we? Sometimes things can feel dark, even when the sun is shining through beautiful trees outside. Sometimes our insides feel dark. Sometimes our world feels dark. I know there's probably a lot of people in this room even that watch the news and sometimes feel dark. Am I right? Yeah, that's not a new thing. Sometimes the news is dark and it always has been. There's a lot of stuff in the world that we don't like to see, but, but we do see it. But what we have to remember is that we have not one set of footprints really in the sand because we are with Jesus. We might not see Jesus' footprints walking next to us. That would be kind of creepy if you think about it. Like if you take a step and then there's another one, take a step and there's, that would, sorry, that would that'd creep me out. But I know that Jesus is with, in, and through me, through the Holy Spirit, right? We're going to do a little fun thing. So I want you guys to get really close together. Not, not, not close to me. Good boys, good boys. I do have four dogs. This works out really well for me. You're far better behaved. Okay, back up about a foot and then kind of circle around. Okay, like face each other. There you go. Still listen better than my dogs. Okay. I'm going to put this over you. Okay, and to make it even better, you can close your eyes and it's really dark. Okay, ready? Here we go. Okay, is it dark? Oh, yeah. Is it really dark? Is it really, really dark? Yeah. Is there room for me? No. 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 How about now? How about no. Now? Hi. No. Hi, guys. No. Hey, 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 guess no. what? Guess, guess, guess what? Look, 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 look. look. Mm. What's this? I found a light. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I, can't I, have see. A little, I, have, I can see all of you now. Look. I can't see. see. If I can't see you, you can't see. <laughs> I might have blinded your children. Okay. I can't. All right. Okay. I think that I think the example's over. Um, my point was we could. I know. I we all look a mess. My point is that it was dark under there, and then I shine this in your little eyes and made you blind for a minute. But you know what? That's like Jesus. Jesus comes into the dark places. And even when we're all cuddled up and we feel like we need a big blanket on top of us because the world's a scary place sometimes, or we got a lot of stuff going on, we have Jesus. We have Jesus in our lives. And you know what else Jesus does? Jesus reminds us of our baptism. Jesus reminds us every single day. No way, Jose. <laughs> uh, Jesus reminds us every single day that he is with us through his light, and do you know how his light comes out? It comes out through us. When you guys go on your merry way today, and when you guys go on your merry way today, when you smile at a stranger, 
When you go to the grocery store and the checkout person looks like she's had a hard morning, and you say, how are you? You're doing a great job. Or even, thank you. Or you just give them a nice smile. That is Jesus shining his light through you. You know that? And it's also Jesus saying, remember your baptism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Should we pray before you guys steal my water? Okay, come up here. No, don't even look at it. <laughs> okay. Last week, I spilled a lot more water. Okay. Actually? Ready? Oh, actually, right on top of a kid's head. Okay. I'll tell you about it later. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for being our light. Thank you for being our light. Help us to remember. Help us to remember. Always. Always. That you are shining through us. That you are shining through us. And in your name we pray. Ready? Amen. Hey, thanks for coming up and seeing me. Sorry you're a little damp. After last week, I wasn't sure if I wanted to read because Nikki gave me such a long one, my voice didn't hold out. But hopefully it will today. Our first Bible reading is from Hosea chapter 5, verses 15 through chapter 6, verse 6. Because the people have trusted in military powers and not God, God decides to withdraw from the scene until Israel acknowledges its guilt and seeks God's face. The response of the people does not acknowledge this guilt and is as fickle as fog or dew, burned away quickly by the sun. God desires loyalty rather than words or meaningless deeds. A reading from Hosea, the fifth and sixth chapters. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their distress, they will beg my favor. Come, let us return to the Lord. For it is he who is torn, and he will heal us. He has struck down, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His appearing is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains that water the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets. I have killed them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. The word of the Lord. Our second Bible reading is from Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. Paul presents Abraham as a living model of right relationships. For Abraham and for us, a right relationship with God involves trusting that God's promises will be fulfilled because God makes the dead alive and calls into existence what otherwise does not exist. A reading from Romans the fourth chapter, verses 13 through 25. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void, for the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. 
so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which is already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the bareness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written, not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Please stand and join in singing the gospel acclamation. Gospel according to Matthew, the ninth chapter. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, If only I touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, you may be seated. Sisters and brothers in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Jesus, what do you see in that tax collector Matthew? that you would want him to follow you. He who probably outbid all kinds of other Roman citizens in order to get the tax collection job because he said he could get more taxes than anybody else. Jesus, what did you see in this man whose own people revile him, hate him, Did you see someone who would be a good fundraiser for the cause? 
who could manipulate and cajole people into donating to the party of Jesus, the new charismatic preacher in town? And he threw quite a party for you, didn't he? With other tax collectors and sinners. Do you think it wise, Jesus, to associate with them? especially since you are now beginning to have some name recognition in the area. Oh, Jesus, your advisor should advise against this low life. Matthew is not worth it. And what were you thinking, Jesus, to allow this woman, this no-name woman who has been hemorrhaging for 12 years, to touch your robe? No, you didn't call her to do so, but she did, and you did not rebuke her. She has made you unclean, Jesus. For we know that she is unclean with all of that blood flow. This puts you in a very bad light, Jesus. Your poll numbers are beginning to fall. Being unclean makes you a lot less popular with the people. And you will have to undergo a ritual cleansing away from others. Oh, and really, raising a little girl from the dead? Who is she? Other than to her family, she's not important. She's not worth your time, Jesus, and your touch. Don't bother with the children, Jesus. No matter how many babies you kiss and how many hands you shake, the smell of death will linger on you. For once again, Jesus, touching her in her death makes you unclean. It's not a good optic. And Jesus, really, what are you doing here at St. Andrew's this morning with this motley crew? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm looking out there, and I know some of you. I don't know all of you, but I'm looking out there, and I'm not seeing many who are righteous. Oh, maybe just me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe, Jesus, you came here because of me today. I, I don't know. I think I'm worth it, but is it worth it, really, to be here with these folks, sinners all, and one, one righteous person. Yeah. Not looking good for you today, Jesus. <laughs> there are so many ways that Jesus defied the norms of his time. You heard several of those today. Jesus defied social customs. He crossed boundaries that never should have been crossed. And he made people feel like something had shifted. You and I need to think about this deeply. We need to really under examine our understanding of who Jesus is and was and will be. For this is the one whom we proclaim to be following. And we're being asked to do what he did up to a point. He eats with those who are despised, those who are not necessarily observant of the law as given by God to Moses. He spends time in their homes he talks to them. He heals them. He listens to them. These are the people with whom Jesus spent his time, outcasts, sinners. Those who were shunned by society were not important. A dead girl, for crying out loud. A woman, 12 years ill, tax collectors and sinners, and the list goes on. Fill in the blank. What does that say to us about who Jesus is? What does that say to us about who we are to be? And so this morning, it leads us to ask ourselves what kind of God this is who absolutely delights in the lowly, the humble, the crud of society. 
Do you remember that story? And it's in, in varying gospels there. But remember the story of Jesus being led out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan? And, you know, there's a couple of temptations that go on. And then at one juncture, Satan takes Jesus to a high mountain so he can see all the kingdoms of the world. And Satan is so expansive. And he says to Jesus, these are all yours if you fall down and you worship me. Jesus corrects Satan's really bad theology at that point. And he says, do you remember, Satan? Worship the Lord your God only and serve him only. Did you catch that? Serve God only. And as you're serving God, we are also serving the neighbor. Jesus expands on that. He says the, the most important piece of the whole of the law is to serve God and to serve your neighbor as yourself. Service for Jesus is the absolute key to his ministry on this earth, and it is the key to his death and to his resurrection. We do not see Jesus doing all that he does for his own good. He does absolutely nothing to benefit himself but rather to bring glory to God and change the hearts of humankind so that we might know what real power is. Real power is in being, ser in, in being a, a servant to God and a servant to our neighbor, to the world, to the earth, to the creation. How does that challenge us? We have to think about it. This is a recurring theme throughout all of Scripture. Now, I'm not telling you something today that you haven't heard before, but it is good to be reminded what it means to be a follower, a follower of Jesus Christ. And what we discover time and again is that there is a cost to following Jesus. A cost to being a disciple. Because this is not about what Jesus can do for me, but rather about what Jesus has done for all of creation and for all people in his death and his resurrection and how we are all then called to live out our faith bringing God's hope God's forgiveness God's healing into this broken world I mean Nikki talked a little bit about the news today that can bring us down there's always not a lot of hope in the news but we're called as the people of God who have followed, have decided to follow Christ to bring that hope, to bring that healing into this world. You know our world is obsessed with power, right? Our world is chaotic being obsessed by power. But we must define that power. This is not God's power that comes through service, but it's personal power. What can I get for me? And we, as the disciples of Jesus Christ, are to stand against that and stand for the despised, the lowly, the outcasts, all of those who are on the very margins of society and even perhaps beyond the margins. When we read the gospel this morning, we initially hear a very typical call story. Jesus sees Matthew, a tax collector, and he says to him, follow me. And Matthew gets up and follows him. There's never any mention of Matthew saying to Jesus, can you wait till the end of the day when I can turn in my tax receipts to the Romans? You know, I mean, if I, if I don't, I'm going to get in a lot of trouble. I mean, for whatever reason, Jesus has chosen Matthew, and he commands him. He doesn't invite him, by the way. He commands him to follow him, and he does. I don't know about you, but chances are pretty good 
that if Jesus came up and said that to me, I would say, well, let me think about it for a little while and more than a second. But let me think about maybe a week. Give me a week. Give me a week, Jesus, and then, and then you'll have my answer. I mean, people, we have commitments, don't we? To other people, to work, to school, to retirement, whatever it happens to be. But there it is. Jesus says, follow me. But, 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 no buts allowed. I read a, a commentator this week, and he wrote this, and I have to quote this because I thought it was so good. And he writes, the call from Jesus does not involve a multiple choice test. The command is simple, yet profound, and the answer is, yes, I will, or no, I won't. The call is action-oriented, for it requires us to live now as if the rule and reign of God had come upon us in its fullness. It requires us to live now as if the lion and the lamb were already lying down together. Prep time is not needed. It's not needed, it's minimal, because on-the-job training is the preferred modus operandi." Unquote. I was struck by this because the command requires a yes, I will, or no, I won't kind of answer. And yet, when I look at the collection of Jesus' followers, the diversity of this group, the sinfulness of this group, it is hard for me to envision that a yes or no answer is the complete picture. Because you know, folks, we might say yes today. And tomorrow we might say no. We fail often as Jesus followers. We sometimes walk away or we are caught following a different way that maybe has the name of Jesus attached to it, but is not the way of Christ. But it becomes the way of Vicki Taylor or insert your own name in there and it becomes all about me and not about the other. That happens. So the yes can become a no, and the no can become a yes. Leaping into the unknown of following after Jesus takes a tremendous amount of trust. And it is trust in God. It's called the leap of faith. And it is, by the way, for the faint-hearted as well as for everyone. The unknown, like touching the robe of Jesus and being healed. The unknown, like dying and then feeling the hand of Jesus leading us back into life. Like Abraham and Sarah dropping everything as God says, leave your home and go over here. And they have no idea of this new place that God has commanded them to go. Trust. In God. Although it is often imperfect, it is needed to heed the call, to let go of what we know and what we wish for and allow God to guide us, allow Jesus to take us by the hand and lead us into life, not because we are righteous, but because God loves us. So what does Jesus see in Matthew and in the woman who has a medical condition and in the young girl who has died? What does Jesus see in you and me? He sees the image of God. He sees saint and sinner. And he calls us into his presence to be his voice, his hands, his feet in this world, so that all may come to hear this call of grace and hope. Yes, we will fail at times as followers. The disciples certainly did. But I don't want anyone to walk out of here today thinking that their failures has turned God away. Nothing can be further from the truth. For the Spirit of God is always at work in each of us and the whole world. And through that Spirit, 
God has deemed us worthy of God's love through Christ our Lord. Follow me, Jesus says, and we say, we will. We will, from death to life. Amen. Please stand for our next hymn. Please join in confessing the Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue now with the prayers of intercession. Each portion of the prayers will end with the words, God in your mercy, and I would ask you to please respond, hear our prayer. Trusting in God's abundant mercy, let us offer our prayers for a world in need. We pray, O oh God, for the church. Unite us with any on the margins, that the whole world recognizes that your mercy is greater than our human capacity to restrict it. God in your mercy. We pray, O oh God, for creation. Tend forests and fields and safeguard all cattle, birds, and wild animals. Preserve lakes, rivers, and oceans, and send rains to water the earth. Revive lands recovering from national, natural disasters. God, in your mercy. Yes. 
We pray, O oh God, for the nations. Awaken in our leaders compassion for people who have too often felt forgotten or neglected, and inspire policy solutions that promote equity and inclusion. God, in your mercy. We pray, O oh God, for all who are in need. Accompany anyone enduring chronic illness, any who suffer in secret, and those grieving a loved one's death. Send healing for all who plead for relief from sickness or pain, especially those whom we now name in our hearts or name out loud. God, in your mercy. We pray, O oh God, for the eradication of racial hatred. On this week, when we commemorate the Emmanuel Nine, we implore you to cast out the demons of white supremacy that make us believe lies about ourselves and our neighbors. God, in your mercy. We give thanks, O oh God, for Barnabas and all the saints. Renew our faith that you can do what you have promised and raise us with all our beloved dead to new life. God, in your mercy. Receive our prayers and answer us, O oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please take a time to share the sign of peace with one another. God's peace. God's peace, Nikki. God's peace. <laughs> okay, enough, t enough peace shared. <laughs> we get to the offering. Please be seated. <laughs> Would you please stand? In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and gave it for all to eat. And he said, take and eat this bread. This is my body that is given for you. Do this always in remembrance of me. 
Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Would those who are serving communion please come forward to get ready. And for those of you worshiping online, now is the time to take the bread you have gathered and eat it as you hear these words, the body of Christ given for you. And taking the wine or grape juice, drink it as you hear these words, the blood of Christ shed for you. And there will be two stations for communion today. Come forward as you'd like. Come down the middle aisle as best you can. Uh, there will be bread and gluten-free crackers for you to take and red wine or white grape juice as an option. And then we ask that you put your little cups into the little bowls. All are welcome to commune here at St. Andrews. Everybody is invited to the table of grace. We continue with communion. Let's go. 